Hey folks, today I'm gonna to catch you up on three quick fixes that I've recently incorporated here to address some issues on my fifth wheel. Actually make that four, I'll include a bonus fourth at the end of the video. But as I was saying, these are all pretty small. They're kind of insignificant in the grand scheme of things. You know, I don't know about you, but I always find it helpful to hear from other owners that share fixes to issues that they've dealt with. And that way, if I ever encounter them myself, I can kind of learn from what they've already done, you know, kind of benchmark. And as you'll see here in just a minute, they aren't necessarily manufacturer related or the fault of Jayco in this case, but I think really more a combination of how I'm using the product more or less. And really these issues I'll present, they're pretty common to RVers in general. Definitely if you have a fifth wheel for sure. So I hope this video is helpful for that purpose. And with that, let's jump right in. All right, so the first issue is one that I encountered on a trip a few months back actually. And initially it presented itself through my Furion observation cameras, which you know I keep in my truck while I'm driving to have an extra set of eyes on the rear of the coach and the sides here. And I find these especially helpful when you're making lane changes. And so anyway, I was on the road for about three hours and all of a sudden the Furion display in my truck, the camera feed cut out. I still had power on the display itself, just no signal, no image, right? So I've seen this happen on rare occasions, you know, intermittently, sometimes due to signal interference or whatnot, but usually it'll come back within a few seconds or a few minutes at most. But in this case, the picture never came back on. Well, as you can imagine, there's not a lot of troubleshooting that I could do while driving. And as you know, Jayco, like most RV manufacturers, they wire the camera power on the Furion cameras to the running lights on the coach through the seven-way connector. So first instinct was to see if I could tell if my running lights were still on on the coach and so when I made turns and I got a glance down the side of the rig it appeared that my running lights were still on I mean it was broad daylight so kind of hard to tell but that was about the extent of the troubleshooting that I performed while I was on the road and then after I got to my destination and unhitched I took a closer look at it more in depth and to my surprise, it worked just fine. When I reconnected the seven-way adapter to the truck, all the clearance lights came on, as did the Furion backup camera. And so at the time, I just chalked it up to an, you know, an intermittent problem that kind of resolved itself on its own. Now, let me just interject. If you're a subscriber to my channel and you're confused right now because you know I did a video recently on how to change the power source, on your Furion cameras from the running lights to a dedicated 12 volt switch. Let me just be clear that this problem I'm describing here, this incident was before I did that mod, meaning the cameras at this time were still powered through the running lights. Anyway, that's a separate mod I completed after this incident. So if you haven't seen the Furion camera mod, the video there, definitely check it out. I'll put a card up for it. But as I was saying, this incident was several months back and at the time the cameras were still powered by the running lights. So back to the saga. Well, on my return trip home, everything was working fine at the start of the trip. You know, all the cameras were working as normal, but then the same thing happened a few hours into the trip. The camera signals, they all went out. I still had connectivity to the coach because the brake controller was working. I didn't have any error messages. You know, a lot of modern trucks, when they detect a signal loss on your seven-way connector, it'll give you a warning in the center cluster, but I had nothing of that sort. But this time I had a lunch stop plan. And so at the rester, I got out and I noticed right away that my running lights were not on on the coach. And so that would explain why the cameras weren't working, of course. So I wiggled the seven-way connector in the bed of the truck, not the cable itself, but the actual connector. And just like that, the running lights came on again instantly. I mean, I probably barely touched the connector and it was all the way in firmly, but apparently it wasn't making good contact with that particular pin. And so it was causing the running lights to intermittently go on and off. So when I got back home, I cleaned out the seven-way connector to make sure there's no corrosion or anything going on inside. And then I also made sure that these tabs, the individual tabs were all bent kind of inward to make a good contact and kind of pinch the connector on my truck side. And then I got a tube of this dielectric grease here and coated everything real thoroughly inside here and also on my truck seven-way connector. And that way it will prevent any corrosion from building up. So ever since I did this, I have not had any more connectivity issues here on the seven-way connector. So I think there was just some corrosion perhaps. Maybe some of the tabs weren't quite pinching hard enough on the connector on my truck. 
Now, it's my understanding that this dielectric grease, it doesn't magically conduct electricity. In fact, this is an insulator from what I understand. So you can't just spread this all over everything and just expect it to magically conduct electricity. But it does prevent corrosion and protect everything so that when it's not connected to the other end on your truck, that it's protecting you know, moisture and other elements in the air. So highly recommend if you don't have a tube of this around, go ahead and coat everything here inside the seven-way connector and also on your truck. All right, the second issue is going to be inside, thank goodness, because today the heat index is, I think, almost 100 with the humidity. Super hot, so I've got all three of the ACs running. Hopefully you'll be able to hear me still. But the second issue is inside here, and it has to do with the refrigerator here. So you can see my unit came with this Whirlpool residential refrigerator. I've been very pleased with it. It's just a basic, you know, residential counter depth refrigerator. But there's this issue when you use the refrigerator side door here on the right side and you open it up, you'll notice that adjacent here, perpendicular, is a wall and a door here going to my bunk room. And so no matter how careful we've been since we've owned the unit, adults and kids, when we open this door, we've always been careful not to let it swing all the way open and then hit this door. In fact, if you come real close, you can see all the different nicks along here that I've touched up with stain pens. And that is from the door handle here swinging open and swinging into the door and denting it and kind of nicking it again and again and again. And basically, you know, as you load up your refrigerator here in the door, the door becomes heavier and it gets harder to control. And so no matter how careful we would try to be, the door would keep hitting and hitting this bunk room door and leaving all kinds of nicks. And so this was kind of one of those pesky, annoying problems that I wanted to come up with a solution to prevent that from happening once and for all. So I finally decided to do something about it. And let me show you what I came up with. So you'll notice at the top of the refrigerator here where the hinge is, there is a new bolt here, kind of acting like a pin. And basically this bolt acting like a pin keeps the hinge from going any further. You can see because of the position of that bolt, it stops the hinge from opening any further. And so the result is now you can see I've got a good about a hand, about four or five inches distance between the handle of the refrigerator and the bunk room door. No matter how hard I push and swing on it, every time up here you can see what's going on, that bolt, that pin is stopping the refrigerator door from opening any further. And so I'd imagine this is a pretty common problem with a lot of RV floor plans. You know, when you have a refrigerator and then an adjacent perpendicular wall or a door, and then that refrigerator door wants to open up and bang into your adjacent wall there. And so adding this little pin solves that problem. It acts like a catch almost and stops the door from opening any further. All right, so for those curious on the details on how I did this, I'll share that real quickly. It's pretty straightforward. All you need is a bolt here, just a spare bolt, and you can see mine is probably a diameter of the thread, maybe about three-eighths of an inch or so. The size of the head here really doesn't matter. It's just I wanted something substantial enough that I could anchor into the door. So you just need a spare bolt, something along those lines, and then just a drill bit that's slightly smaller than the thread, the diameter of the bolt, and then some epoxy. And really the hardest part was just determining the location for that bolt in the refrigerator door. So you can see what it looks like in the closed position here. And then as I open it, you can see how it catches on the hinge. So I basically just took that bolt and experimented by placing it in different locations here on top of the door until I found a location that seemed like it would catch properly and allow me to have a good, you know, four, five, six inches between the refrigerator door and my door here on the bunk room so that it would catch properly. So you just gotta experiment with the location of that bolt before you actually drill your hole here and figure out where's the best spot for that bolt so that it catches. And so again, I just put the bolt on top of there and practiced opening and closing the door until I got that position just right. So once I figured out where the bolt should go, I just took a Sharpie and put a black dot there on top and then I just took a drill bit, one that was slightly smaller than the size, the diameter of the bolt, and drilled into the top here. Now, as far as I know here, on my model at least, this is just kind of a plastic up here on top of the refrigerator, the casing, and then there are no electronics 
as far as I know on this right side on the refrigerator side obviously you can see on the freezer side you've got all that going on but here on the right side I don't think there's really any electronics or anything going on inside of here so it's my understanding that all that you'll find inside of here is just some kind of expanding foam that they use as insulation and so I was not concerned about drilling into my refrigerator here because it's just foam inside but again if you've got a different model you might want to make sure that there's nothing inside here that could get damaged with you drilling a hole like that but i basically just drilled that hole first and then is where the epoxy came into play all right so the second and third acs have shut off it's feeling a lot cooler in here now and hopefully you can hear me better but as i was saying this is where the epoxy comes into play i've become a big fan of epoxy especially in rv projects you know where you're anchoring something into a substrate or a wall where it doesn't really have anything solid for a screw or bolt to grab onto and so basically with this epoxy you've got two different chambers here of two different chemicals and when everything gets mixed together it gets activated and then when it cures it it makes this really super strong bond that's very permanent and so i really like this a lot basically what i did is i just mixed some up on a scrap piece of cardboard here mix it up real well and then i took that epoxy and after i drilled my hole in the top of the refrigerator here before i put the bolt in i filled it with that epoxy that i mixed up and that way when the bolt gets inserted because there's only just foam inside of here there's not solid wood or metal or something for that bolt to grab onto and with all the pressure of this hinge you know i want this bolt to be solid i don't want it to be moving or shifting and so that epoxy in the hole where the bolt goes is then going to kind of bond and solidify with that foam and make that bolt more or less permanent so that it's not shifting when the refrigerator door is opening and closing. So I'm a big fan of epoxy, but once you get the bolt inserted there, you just gotta wait and let that epoxy set up. You can use any brand of epoxy, but most of them are gonna suggest letting it set up for about 24 hours, and then it'll become permanent there. So the end result, I'm really pleased with how this turned out. You can see on top there as I open the door, how that bolt kind of acts like a pin and it catches the refrigerator door. And so now the refrigerator door, it opens a little bit past 90 degrees. You know, I'd say that's probably about maybe 100, 105 degrees, enough that you can still get comfortably, you know, in there and get access to everything, but yet it leaves that nice, you know, five to six inches clearance between the handle and your door here. And so I'm really pleased with how this worked out. I did this about three months ago, and so we've used it quite a bit extensively, has worked out flawlessly. The bolt up here has not shifted or moved at all, so that epoxy has really worked out well. So highly recommend this fix if you have a similar situation like me and you've got a refrigerator door that's opening up and banging into an adjacent perpendicular wall. All right, moving on to the third issue, and you can see for this one I brought in my kitchen slide partially to demonstrate it. But this issue, this problem is one that I had a recent viewer comment on and ask me about, and I'm actually encountering the same problem. In fact, I've encountered it pretty much from day one when I took delivery, and it's a common problem for really most RVers, depending on your floor plan, where you've got an island or opposing cabinets and drawers, and those drawers want to open up in transit and then bang into another cabinet, you know, scuffing it up and marking it up. So I noticed pretty early on after I got all my stuff loaded up here that when I get to a destination, in particular, this bottom drawer seemed to be a troublemaker. I would get to a destination and I noticed this drawer was open and then I could see it was all scuffed and rubbed up here on the opposite cabinet door here on my island. And so basically that cabinet drawer was opening in transit. You know, you go over a bump or you turn one way and the force causes that door to that drawer to open up and bang into there and so you know it's kind of a nuisance and I just resorted to taking an oven mitt like this or a towel or something you know and putting it on the the drawer there and that way at least it has something to kind of cushion as it opens and closes but it was really a nuisance and it was something that for quite some time I wanted to fix permanently so I wouldn't have to do it but I kept putting it off for the longest time. So when a viewer asked about it, I said, you know what, I'm gonna take care of this once and for all. And so let me share what I've come up with. Now, before I show you the solution I came up with, and it's really pretty simple, but before I show you it, let me talk a little bit about what I believe is the underlying problem, the culprit for this particular issue. And it has to do with the soft close 
drawer mechanisms that are becoming really popular in RVs nowadays. So depending on your RV manufacturer, in my case it's of course Jayco Pinnacle, but a lot of brands are putting these soft closed drawer mechanisms, you know, it's kind of considered a, an upgraded feature, very popular in houses over the last decade or so. And basically, instead of you having to close the drawer all the way yourself, you know it kind of grabs the drawer the last three or four inches there's like a spring mechanism in the slide and it grabs the drawer and then pulls it shut all the way that's how it's supposed to work anyway and so that soft close mechanism is kind of a, just a nice feature but then the added benefit for an rv application is there's a spring you know something that's holding that drawer shut so the same force that pulls it shut is kind of keeping it shut and so that's an added benefit in an rv application while you're on the road then that same mechanism should theoretically hold that drawer shut from coming open without you needing some other kind of clasp you know that holds that drawer shut so if you've got an rv that doesn't have a soft close mechanism you're probably going to see these little clasps these little catches at the top center of your drawers or maybe underneath that are then you're pushing it in just like the catches that are up here in this cabinet that you can see here so i believe that is the problem and so where i'm going with this is you know there's a spring mechanism that is pulling that drawer in and that soft close mechanism and so if you think about it I would imagine in the soft closed drawer world, there are different specs, different ratings perhaps on the force of the soft closed mechanism as far as what kind of weight rating for the drawer and what kind of contents they anticipate that you'll put inside the drawer. Because if the force on that spring is too strong, it'd be like you know somebody slamming that drawer shut every time if it's too strong, right? And you don't want that. You don't want it to be slamming shut. But if it's not strong enough, then it's not going to work effectively and it won't catch it. You can see this one here is just barely able to pull the drawer shut with everything I've got loaded in here and I've got it loaded pretty full. And so I think the problem is, is that I have loaded a lot more, especially in this bottom drawer, a lot more on the weight than the mechanism, the soft close mechanism, whatever force rating it's rated at, I've loaded this up more than what it typically was intended for. And so as a result, you can see here when I push this shut, it sort of goes shut, but I'm still having to mostly shut it myself. And so that's why my theory is that I've put more weight in this drawer than they anticipated, such that the soft close mechanism is, is kind of overwhelmed. And so it's no longer really pulling it in effectively. It doesn't have enough force pulling that drawer in. And so as a result, then when I go on the road, it's not holding that drawer shut all the way. It tends to be a little bit weaker. And so that is the underlying source of the problem. So sure, maybe you know RV manufacturers could put a uh, heavier drawer slide in there that's got a stronger force rating on it. But then to be fair, you gotta say, well, how does the RV manufacturer know how much weight you know, each customer is going to put in their drawers. It could be different. You know, for me, I put some heavier items in this drawer. You can see I've got some mugs here, some pots, and then some more things up top here. And so for me, I guess I've just put more weight in here than they anticipated. And that's why it doesn't want to stay shut so well. So the solution for me is pretty simple. You probably figured it out already. It's just adding a catch. So you can see right here on the drawer front, I added this little catch here. It's got kind of like a hook right here, but then over here, it's got a spring loaded mechanism that receives that hook and that spring has a certain amount of force that it's rated for. And so in this case, mine was rated for a force of 10 pounds that it's gonna hold back when you shut that drawer. And so you can hear it kind of has a positive click sound when I shut it. And now when I pull on here, it doesn't pull open right away. And I did the same thing on the opposite side here on my trash can drawer. This is also supposed to be a soft close drawer, but you can see I've loaded it up pretty good with a bunch of different cleaning supplies. And so all that extra weight kind of diminishes the force that the soft close mechanism is able to exert so I had to push this one shut so I added the same catch here now this one actually came from the factory from Jacob with a standard metal catch you know the same metal catches that are on all the cabinet doors here so it has a little metal pin right here and then the two little cylinders that it gets pinched between there but these metal catches here I don't think they're rated for as much in terms of force and so they work great for just a cabinet door like in this situation where you don't have a lot of weight but I think when you're dealing with the weight of this entire drawer here it really wasn't sufficient enough and so that catch wasn't working whereas this one that I've replaced it with although it's made out of plastic you can see it is reinforced the receiving end is rated at again 10 pounds of 
force. And so this one has a lot more, you can hear just a lot more positive grabbing power here, and then it doesn't pull open in transit. And so again, I went with ones that are rated for 10 pounds. I saw ones for five pounds, for eight pounds, 10 pounds seemed to be about the right amount of force in my case. So I went ahead and put one here on the trash can drawer and then added one down on this bottom drawer. I have not done it yet on these two upper drawers. I don't seem to have as much of a problem with these opening in transit so far. If I do, I'll simply do the same thing and add a catch to that. But depending on your floor plan and what you've got you know, in your drawers, you may not have a problem with your bottom drawer. It might be one of these two drawers, the middle or the upper one that you need to add on that catch. So just kind of figure out which drawers are the troublemakers in your case and then get one of those catches and add them onto your drawers. And I'll just mention when you add one of those catches to your drawers, it is gonna require a little bit more force to open now because that catch is trying to keep the drawer shut. But it's just a little bit of extra force. And in my opinion, you know, knowing that this drawer is now gonna be shut during transit and you don't have to worry about it opening, it's worth that little bit of extra force that you're gonna to have to use to open it up. Now, as far as mounting these, you know, ideally these catches should go in the center of a drawer, you know, such as up here. But in this case, because I've got this double drawer that's kind of stacked, I didn't have enough clearance to put it here and then have the receiving end where it catches up here without rubbing in and bumping into things that were in this drawer. And so that's why I opted to put it off to the side here. I mean, I think ideally I probably could have tried to work it onto the bottom here because there's a gap at the bottom of the drawer and that way it would be hidden. You wouldn't see the catch. But in my case, I just chose to put it off to the side here. It's a lot easier to install and mount. But basically, you just decide where you're going to put it. Then you put the one end here on your drawer face. And then the receiving end, once you kind of get that one end, you kind of just marry up and line up where it needs to go on the face frame of your cabinet. And just carefully hold it in place and then screw it in. And once it's screwed in, it is permanent. I mean, this is always going to be working from now on. And it will keep my drawers shut. Okay, so that's the solution I came up with here on this third issue to keep my cabinet drawers from opening while in transit. Now, if you're interested in purchasing one of these catches, I'll put an affiliate link in the description below. So I appreciate you using those to support the channel. Like I said, these are rated at 10 pounds on the force rating. They are plastic, but they seem to be pretty sturdy, pretty durable. In fact, I'm almost sure that at least one or two previous RVs I've owned used a very similar catch from the factory that was installed by the manufacturer. And so I'm pretty sure these are being supplied to RV manufacturers very similar to this one if not the same all right as promised number four the bonus issue and that is my front cap light now if you've seen my other videos you know that about six months ago my front cap light it went out due to water intrusion and first of all let me just say as much of a problem as this front cap light has been I absolutely love the neon tube style light I think it really looks high-end it's really a unique feature compared to just the generic and exposed LED strips like almost all the other brands have and so I really like the neon tube accent that's up here on the front cap but as I was saying I had to replace the LED strip inside about six months ago because it wasn't sealed properly from the factory and so water got into the inner vinyl tube and then that damaged of course the circuitry and the LED strip that's inside that's kind of embedded inside there and this is by the way probably one of the most common issues or questions that I get from other Pinnacle and North Point owners and it's that they too have had to replace the LED light here due to water intrusion. So I've gotten a lot of requests to detail in depth how to fix this. And would you believe it that after I fixed my own six months ago, it failed again. That's right, it failed again. And folks, I think you'll be surprised why it failed. I was at least. And so recently I took it all apart. I redid the entire light a second time and this time I documented it. So stay tuned, I'll plan to release a specific video covering just the steps from start to finish on how to fix this LED light here in the neon style tube. And get it fixed once and for all, right? And so I'll plan to release that video in the next couple weeks, but that is the fourth fix that I had to complete recently. So stay tuned for more details on that one. Well, all right, folks, those are the issues that I wanted to share today. Like I mentioned earlier, they're really insignificant in the grand scheme of things, but it's nice not to have to deal with those pesky issues anymore and know that they're resolved for good. Now, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below, especially if you've encountered some of these same issues that I presented here in today's video or 
maybe some related issues and hear about how you resolve those problems. Maybe we can all learn from each other on that. So definitely let me know in the comments below. As I mentioned before, I will include affiliate links to the different products featured in today's video. So I appreciate you using those to support the channel. As always, thanks for watching.